So it's lovely to join you this afternoon. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Lisa O'Brien. I'm the CEO of the Smith family, and it's a pleasure to be co-hosting this conference with the RACI. And I also have the pleasure now of introducing our first speaker for the afternoon. She is a senior lecturer on education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and the faculty director of education policy and management master's program. Over the last 20 years, Dr. Mapp's research and practice focus has been on the cultivation of partnerships between families, community members, and educators. Partnerships that support student achievement and school improvement. I am very much looking forward to hearing from her. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Karen Mapp. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, you can do better than that. Good afternoon. Ah, there we go. Much, much, much better. I know you've had some rice and some carbohydrates, so you might be a little ooh, down. So I'm going to do everything I can to bring you back up, all right? One of the th ways I do that is I don't like podiums. I like to be near you because a lot of family engagement work is about relationships. And so one of the things that sometimes I do when I go to schools is I look to see are there barriers between families and school staff. And so we try to move those away so that we can reach out and touch everybody, okay? So I'm gonna move around a little bit. I hope I don't drive the cameraman crazy with dancing about, but that's what I'm going to do. So first of all, my students, have pushed me very hard to use social media. And I used to have this slide last in my PowerPoint, but they said, Professor Mapp, you have to put it first. Because if you put it first, then people will tweet as you talk. So there it is. So that's my Twitter handle, and please make sure you also use the Twitter handle for the conference, which I think is PEC P -E 2017, is that right? No, PEC PEC P -Conf? 17, okay. So if you look on the brochure and things like that, you'll see it, right, Robert? Okay, good. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. If it works, I'm not getting any movement. Guys in the back, is there something happening? It's not moving. Is it on? So I'm going to ask you a question while we try to get this working. How many of you in this room have been classroom teachers? Ah, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Let me ask you a quick question then, secondly. How many of you, there we go, how many of you in your pre-service training, okay, received a full course, not a workshop, a full course, on family engagement. Let me see those hands go up. Uh-oh. One. There were a lot of hands raised a mere 10 seconds ago. But as you can see, we have done a pretty lousy job of building our own capacity to work with families. This is a question I get asked a lot. Why is it after all these years of research, 40 years now, we have wonderful research linking family engagement with student outcomes, family engagement with wonderful outcomes for our schools and our districts, but yet we are still struggling to have effective practice and family engagement. Well, you just saw why. The big reason why is that we have not built the capacity of our staff or our families to partner. Now, when I travel around the world, sometimes I notice that we are spending a little more time on building the capacity of our families. So we have perhaps family, family coordinators in our schools, or maybe we have 
parent universities or parent academies. But we have to spend the same amount of time and resource on our staff, on our practitioners, as we do on building the capacity of our families. Because if we don't do that, ladies and gentlemen, we end up with what we call disequilibrium. We end up with our families learning how to be engaged, getting all charged up, we're all excited, and then they go to the school, chilly climates. Oh, no, 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 we know we're not going to share power with you. We haven't learned how to do that well. So that's why we can't just spend time on parent universities. We have to spend time on building the practice of our teachers, our school leaders, our central office staff. So what happened was in 2011, Secretary Arne Duncan called me and said, you know, we are really interested in doing better. And actually, they got a bit of a push from a national group that was formed, and Heather Weiss and I and Ann Henderson and others were really pushing the federal government around changing policies to be more supportive of family engagement. And so because of that push, they decided to have me come in as a consultant for about two years to figure out what was it the federal government could offer to schools and districts that would help them around family engagement. And so because of the interviews I did with some of the staff at the Department of Education, but also with practitioners in the field and parents and other researchers and policymakers, I thought about something that might help people understand what does effective practice look like. So in addition to the data I collected from the field itself, and then pairing that with what we know from the research, and not just research on family engagement, but also research from things about how do we build trust with one another. So Tony Bryke at the Chicago Consortium on School Research has done wonderful work. It's a book called Trust in Schools where they talk about how do we build those bonds of trust among the adult stakeholders that support our children. I also looked at the adult motivation and learning work. How do we get people to change their practice? And also leadership development research. So taking all of those things together, we put together a framework that was intended to be what we say is a compass, a guide, and not a roadmap. Now, what's the difference? The reason why we say a guide, a compass, and not a road map is because when I was Deputy Superintendent for Family and Community Engagement in Boston, I would have people from Detroit and San Francisco and Los Angeles and Chicago come to see me and they'd say, Dr. Mapp, we're going to just take your blueprint that you put together in Boston and we're going to apply it to Los Angeles. Not a good idea because the context is very different. And so we decided that providing you and everyone else out there trying to do effective family engagement with a compass, with direction, was the best way to go, rather than one, two, three, four steps. So what I'm going to try to do now is share with you what we put together in the framework. I've been hearing from you as I've walked around this lovely conference that you want really practical strategies. And so that's what we're going to try to offer you this afternoon. So this is the dual capacity framework for family school partnerships. And so I'm going to go through the framework, but I'm also going to talk to you about things I've noticed about effective practice in the field. And so we'll go through these one by one. So first of all, you all absolutely wonderfully displayed the problem around capacity. We're all told, go forth and do family engagement. But we haven't been trained on how to really do it well. And it's a skill. And it's hard. So we have to provide you with support. So part of the reason why we've had these ineffective practices is because, again, we don't have the capacity. We haven't built the capacity to do the work well. So how many of you in this room, and this is the metaphor I used yesterday because we did a deep dive on the framework, but how many of you have ever ridden a bicycle in your life? Let me see those hands. Okay. So what I'm going to share with you right now 
are what we call, or what I call, the essential bike parts of effective family engagement practice. Now, why do I say bike parts? Let me ask you a question. What are the essential components of every single bicycle? What are they? Wheels. Wheels. What else? The frame. What else? The pedals, the handlebars, the seat, right? Brakes, chain. Okay, those are pretty much the essential parts of every bicycle. But if I am riding a bike in the Tour de France, never gonna happen, ladies and gentlemen, am I gonna use the same bicycle I would use to go up in the mountains? No, of course not. What's gonna be different? The wheels, the tires. The tires on the mountain bike are gonna be thick, right? The tires on the racing bike, thin. What else? The frame, I heard the frame. Frame is gonna be heavy on a mountain bike, thin on a racing bike. Now, they all have a frame, they all have tires, they all have handlebars, but depending on the context, the shape and the design might be a little different. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to talk to you about the essential elements of effective practice of family engagement, but depending on where you are, you might be in Tanzania or Queensland or Melbourne. They might be a little bit different, but what I want to try to get you to think about is that you have to have them to have effective practice. Just like you have to have those parts to have a bike, this is what you'll need to have to have effective practice, okay? So you see these conditions. We call them opportunity conditions. These are the opportunities that you have to create in your family engagement initiatives in order to have effective practice. The ones on the right, we call those organizational conditions. Those are the conditions that your organization, your institutions, your schools, your district offices have to have for you to provide you with the tools and support to do this work well. Your organizations have to see family engagement as systemic. It's a part of your systemic practices for whole school reform. Family engagement has to be integrated into everything you do, whether it's human resources or innovative technology, working with instruction. It's gotta be in everything. And we also have to make sure you're provided with the right resources to do the work well. Now, on the other side of what we call process conditions, so if you're designing a family engagement initiative, whether it's an open house, parent-teacher conferences, or other things, literacy nights, each one of these five components needs to be a part of that planning in order for you to have a successful program. The first one, link to learning. All that we do should be linked to learning. In other words, when you look at your family engagement initiative, ask yourself a question. Do our families learn more about what their children should know and be able to do as a result of their participation in this event? And are they able to learn something about how to support their child's learning from participating in this event? Do they get a chance to practice something new? We are very good at handing our families lists and saying, toodaloo, go and do this at home but never showing them what it is, never getting, giving them a chance to practice it with our teachers, with our other staff. So everything we do, ladies and gentlemen, should be linked to learning and development. So if you look at your school goals, your family engagement initiatives should be aligned with those school goals. We do a lot of what Kate Gilchristley, one of our colleagues, calls random acts of family engagement. Oh, we'll try this, we'll do this, we'll do that. And none of it is connected to what we are trying to do in the classroom. And you know what? Our families know, and that's why they don't come back. They want to learn more about how to help support their children and not just talk about this or that. That's not related. So link to learning is very important. What's another condition that has to be a part of the work that we do? It needs to be relational, ladies and gentlemen. We've talked this morning when Debbie Pusher gave her presentation, someone in the audience said, this is all about trust, isn't it? 
Well, if we want to build trust, we have to spend time, be very intentional about building relationships with people. So I'm going to give you a quick example. Now I'm going to really make the cameraman terrible. He's going to say, what's going on? Tanya, how are you? I am great. Where are you from? I'm from Melbourne. You're from Melbourne. Nice to meet you. You too. Let's see, who else can I say? Hi, Catherine. How are Hi, you? I'm very well, thank Where are you. you from? I'm from the Northern Territory. You're from the Northern Territory. OK, sir. Hi, Michael. How are you? Where are you from? Tasmania. Tasmania. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, in order for me to de develop relationships, I've got to come and reach out and touch people. You have to see people. You have to smile right. at them. You have to make them know that you care. You can't do that with a piece of paper. You can't do that with a text. You have to reach out and touch your families. I heard somebody ask a question the other day about, you know, we have a lot of hard to reach parents. Guess what? I've never met a hard to reach parent. Never. What's hard to reach are institutions. Why? Because we create these barriers between us and our families. And so we have to reach out, folks. We have to be not afraid to go into the communities. We can't always ask people to come up here with us, because this feels very intimidating for a lot of people. So you have to make relationship building a part of the work that you do. We also want to make sure that we have an asset-based, strength-based mindset. Now, I'm going to tell you a little secret. As soon as I get my chance, I'm going to change that development versus service orientation to asset versus deficit-based thinking. Now, working for governments, how many of you have worked for governments? You know how sometimes they don't like us to use certain language, right? So they said, oh, no, no, that's too harsh. But it makes the point, right? Asset-based, growth mindset versus deficit-based. That's what we're really trying to say instead of development versus service. Development means, yes, we have a growth mindset versus just providing services to families and saying that families need us. Development is more collaborative. And that's the next one. Debbie did a wonderful presentation today about funds of knowledge and parent knowledge. This is why we have to have a collaborative space, a collaborative culture, because our families know a lot about their children. We need to be equal partners with our families. And so to have that collaborative culture where we honor families' knowledge, their funds of knowledge, their parent knowledge, is key. We can't be the best practitioners that we can be without our families. And then finally, all of our initiatives and programs have to have an interactive component. If we just talk at people all the time and we don't give them a chance to practice, they never really learn. That's how we learn is through practice. So those are the bike components of family engagement. Those are the things you have to have in every single program you design for your families. Now what happens when we start to really put these effective steps into place. You're going to find that your adults begin to grow. And we always talk about capacity building, don't we? But we never define what we mean by capacity. And this is where we've developed, and so I, I kidded Bill yesterday, Lucas. I said, you stole my concept of the C's. Because he had the seven C's, right? I said, I had my four C's first. So we talk about the four C's around capacity. What do we really mean? So my colleague Monica Higgins, who's at Harvard, she's talked about this is how we can define capacity. And actually, you can measure this, ladies and gentlemen. So what do we see happen when we're really building these partnerships? Well, first of all, adults begin to grow in their skills and knowledge, what they know, what they're able to do. But you know, a lot of times we stop there. And we don't realize there are other ways that adults grow and learn. What's another way? Our connections, our networks. Now we have parent-to-parent -parent networks. We have parent-staff networks. People now feel like they're supported. For a lot of teachers, I bet you, you would tell me that sometimes being a teacher can feel isolating. Sometimes you feel alone. But when you have your families, you feel like you have that extra social capital. 
So we grow in terms of our connections and our networks. What else do we do? We grow in terms of our cognition. You know, I didn't always believe, and I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't always believe that there wasn't such a thing as a hard-to-reach parent. I didn't always believe that until I started to go out and interview families and spend time with families, and they said to me, Miss, it's not that we don't care. It's that a lot of times we don't know how to do some of the things the schools would like us to do, or we're intimidated, or they've really kind of been disrespectful to us, and so we're not going back. Or they always think that we can come at the time that they set up, and they haven't asked us, when can we come? So through my experience, my cognition, my beliefs and values about families change significantly. I also used to think that families, I used to describe families as our customers, right? Because I believe that when I work with my principals, if they saw families as customers, that they would treat them better. But I've transformed again. Families aren't our customers. They are our equal partners. And they are our co-producers and co-creators of excellent education systems for our students. Because customer is still distant from us, isn't it? It's not right there with us making decisions. Last but not least, we grow in terms of our confidence. We start to get really confident in being able to do this work. So when we really grow, we start to see that now we've got staff that can do this work very, very well. They're comfortable with families. They welcome families. They're actually also culturally competent, can think about the context. We also now have families who are comfortable in being engaged in lots of different roles, whether it's at home, because not of all, all of our families can always come to the school, in the community, and then perhaps even at school. So what I want to do now is I want to share with you what I've seen out in schools and districts that are operationalizing the framework. What are some of the practices that I've seen that you might want to think about that actually help them do this work well? So this is again the framework, and I'm going to give you a link later on for how you can actually get an article about the framework. But here are the seven high impact practices that I've really seen working well to try to, again, align and operationalize the framework. So the first thing, places that are doing this work well actually have an infrastructure for family engagement in place. So either at the central district office or at the school, there's someone who is in charge of this work who can oversee this work. They're a dedicated part of the senior leadership team. So the district leader has someone or a team that's assigned to coordinate the work throughout the schools in the region. Without that, it's very difficult to coordinate good, strong family engagement practice. Number two, again, family engagement is linked to learning. It's linked to the teaching and learning goals of the district, of the schools. So we look at our data, we see where our kids may be struggling or where there are challenges, and we say that's what our family engagement is going to focus on. So for example, in Boston, in the secondary schools, we noticed the students were lagging behind a little bit in their literacy. So the district strategies around family engagement were aligned with what? Literacy. Again, instead of doing these random acts of family engagement, they align their family engagement practice to help families support their literacy efforts and goals. Policies are changed to make sure that they enhance and enable and not constrain your family engagement. So you may have to look at your policies around when can families and teachers talk to one another. Yesterday we heard a wonderful demonstration or saw a wonderful demonstration about the high school and 
changing the way that they did their parent-teacher conferences, changing the time. Those are the things that you're going to have to do. Think about, does this policy help us or hurt us when it comes to working with our families? Number four, a high priority is placed on cultivating and sustaining those relationships. And I demonstrated, you have to have genuine face-to-face -face contact with your families. You have to create opportunities for people to get to know each other as human beings. I went to one school where they actually had their open house out in a field, and it was a barbecue. And people did something called human bingo. How many of you have ever played human bingo? Okay, human bingo is where you have a bingo card and you have to find someone who meets those characteristics. So they say someone who speaks a second language, someone who immigrated here from another country. So you have to go around and find folks. And nobody knew who were the, who were the teachers, nobody knew who were the parents, but it was a great way to mix and mingle. We do these things at what? Weddings and showers, <laughs> right? But we don't often use these icebreakers to get to know our families. So that's something to think about. Number five, regular opportunities are created for authentic and meaningful engagement of families and students and community members in decision making. Let me give you an example as to what I'm talking about here. One time in Boston, we were going to change the way students pick their schools. And what happened was a group of experts went into the back room and came up with a new strategy. And then I was called in and said, Karen, can you have some community meetings to get parent input? I said, input on what? You've already made the decision. They said, but no, no, if you do these meetings, that will count. Uh-huh, as community engagement. No, no, no. I said, we either do it my way or we're not doing it at all. And then I waited to get fired. <laughs> but I didn't because they said, you know, you're right. We've made the decision and we haven't really asked our families. And so what we then did was we had round tables and we had focus groups and we actually then appointed a few parents on the team to come up with the new design. This is what I mean about meaningful and authentic engagement. Not that false engagement that we try to pull off on our families, and they know the difference. Number six, robust professional development is provided for our practitioners on family engagement. And what I mean by robust is not a one-off workshop. It's the kinds of things we're doing here at this conference, but I hope will continue because it's very difficult for people to change their practice without practice. And Jenny actually is gonna talk about that in her presentation. So the places that are serious about this, they've come up with coaching strategies, training strategies for not only their teachers, but for everyone in the building, school nurses, people who provide lunch service for our families and for our students. And then finally, we develop accountability and assessment systems to measure family engagement. Because what we measure, we can change. We want to see how are we doing? Have we had any impact on those four C's? So these are places that are very, very, very serious about this work. So what I want to do before I close is just to provide you with some additional support and resources for this work. Some of you may know, and some of you in the audience, I've met some folks who actually attended my summer workshop. We have an institute every summer in July for three and a half days where we do a very deep dive on family engagement, and I have a lot of my colleagues present. In fact, Heather has presented at this particular, Heather Wise. We have um, Ann Henderson, we've had uh, Nancy Hill, who does work on family engagement for the secondary school level. So this is something I may be too late for this year, but we'd love you for, to consider for next year. I actually have a free online course. Yes, I said free. <laughs> it is free. So all you have to do is sign up, and it is 
equates to about a six-week course on family engagement. Many of the videos that are in there, you are free to download and use in your own staff development. So this is basically freeware for you. If you need a unit certification, I don't know if they have that here in Australia for teachers where you have to show that you've taken a course to get credit, you can get that certificate at the end and that is a charge of about 50 or 60 USD, okay? And we also, thank goodness, and this has uh, been a lot of hard work and I'm very um, excited about the release of a new book. It's called Powerful Partnerships. It will be released in July. It's being published by Scholastic. And this is a book that I've written with two teachers, which will contain lots of wonderful strategies for teachers on how to build effective, trusting, and respectful relationships with families. And so one of the things that I've tried to do at this conference is be on time. And I know that my time is up. And I hope this was helpful. So thank you very much.